All right. It is 4.30 in the afternoon, February 14th. Happy Valentine's Day. I'm glad you're here. I have an order of business to begin with. If there's available seat, folks standing need to take it. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have to wait outside and watch on the monitor. Don't need anybody on the walls or standing grouped up. So get your seat or, or you'll have to go back outside. If you've got a vacant seat, hold up your hand. There you go. Thank you. And somebody can sit beside you. All right, thank you for your cooperation. I appreciate that very much. Um, Madam Clerk, will you call the roll, please? Representatives Campbell, Carringer, Davis, Doggett, Farmer, Fritz, Glenn, Hardaway, Howell, Johnson, Lambert, Moody, Russell, Cheryl, Towns, Vice Chairman Gillespie, Chairman Holsey. Here. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you very much. Are there any personal orders from the committee? Seeing none, we'll move on. We've got a privilege today. Uh, the, the voters in the state of Tennessee back in 2014 added a constitutional amendment that all judiciary that are nominated will come before uh, the Senate and the House for a confirmation of their nomination. And today we have... Uh, such confirmation going on um, and we want to welcome the nominee from the governor's office uh, his name is Matthew Wilson and uh, he is is here uh, with the the governor's chief counsel and so in a moment we will go out of session and they will come forward and just to tell you how the process works the chief counsel will make some remarks she will introduce the nominee and then at that point, uh, I'll open the floor for any questions that the committee will have of, of the nominee. And uh, at the end of that, we'll go back into session. And then we will vote either to confirm this nomination or reject it. So that's how the process works. So we are now out of session. And so, uh, uh, Council, would you uh, proceed? Thank you. And would you also make sure that you both uh, state your name and your position for the record? Governor Lee. I'd like to thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Vice Chairman and members of the committee. I'm thrilled today to have the opportunity to introduce Governor Lee's nominee for the Tennessee Court of Criminal Appeals in the West, and that is Matt Wilson. Matt focuses his practice exclusively on criminal prosecution. Since 2011, he's been an assistant United States attorney. He started that role in a Republican-led office in Arkansas and then moved to the Western District of Tennessee. He's currently the deputy branch chief of an 18-county area in West Tennessee. He has tried over 100 bench trials, 
numerous federal jury trials, both misdemeanors and felonies, and he has been government counsel on over 70 appellate matters. He carried the largest caseload in his division when he was the division lead narcotics prosecutor, and currently he focuses on white collar prosecution. He's a graduate of Auburn University and the, Un the Florida State University College of Law. He's born and raised in Nashville and now lives in Madison County on a farm near Jackson. Matt is active in his church community. He teaches third grade Sunday school and leads a men's Bible study. And also he and his wife founded a ministry that provide hands-on support to young men who have aged out of the foster care system, as well as those with intellectual disabilities. So in a moment, Matt will make a personal statement and then be open for questioning. But I would like the committee to please note and remember that Matt may not be able to answer all of the questions that you ask him. He does not intend to evade your questions, but he is subject to the code of judicial conduct that requires impartiality. Therefore, answering certain questions now would require him to recuse himself from certain types of cases later. So for example, he will be limited today in his ability to express personal viewpoints or to critique certain pieces of legislation or court decisions that could come before him on the Court of Criminal Appeals. I want you to know that Governor Lee trusts Matt and Governor Lee looks forward to Matt being able to make those hard decisions when he is ultimately confirmed to the court. So without further ado, the governor's nominee for the Court of Criminal Appeals, Matt Wilson. Thank you, Counselor. Thank Welcome, you. General. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Merrick, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, Leader Lambert, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Matthew Wilson, for the record and I'm excited to be here today. I would also like to thank you all for your service to the people of the state of Tennessee. I've been up here all day, and I've seen the hard work that you've been doing, and I'm impressed, and it makes me proud to be a Tennessean. I'd also like to introduce my wife. She's sitting right there. Her name is Jen Wilson. I'm proud of my wife. My wife is involved in another ministry that I'm not able to be a part of, because she's involved in a ministry helping unwed mothers. These girls have nowhere else to turn. And they have children, and they've got no family support. And she works for an organization called Young Lives. It's part of Young Life, which you, you may have heard of. And they provide support, basic needs for these girls, basic needs for the babies, and then for the calling uh, the things that really matter, if you know what I'm, what I'm talking about. But we're here to talk about me today, and I look forward to that. I am a Christian, I am a husband, I am a father, and then I'm a lawyer. I can't talk about the first three, but as to the fourth, they tell me I'm pretty good at it. So I have been a prosecutor, a public servant, for 17 years started out at the state. I've been with the Department of Justice in Jackson since 2011. I also worked in Arkansas for a short time. But during that period, I've tried every type of case. And I guess when they tell you you're good at it, you get promoted. And so I am the deputy chief, and now I'm in charge of the appellate matters in the Eastern Division that Ms. Merrick referred to. So I do a lot of appeals besides my more than 60 criminal jury trials. The matters that I've taken, um, we can talk that, about that if you wish, but I really enjoy appellate work, and that led me to this. So if I wanted to stay with the Department of Justice, they might move me on and I might have to go somewhere else to Washington. I don't want to go to Washington. I'm from Tennessee. I'm a Tennessean by birth and by choice, and I really want to serve my fellow citizens. So here I am, and I'm really excited about this opportunity for that service and humbly ask you to consider me for the Court of Criminal Appeals. Thank you, General. All right, uh, the floor is now open for questions from the, the committee. Chairman Farmer. Yeah, hey, and uh, Andrew Farmer here. Uh, I represent Fortress of Severe in Jefferson County. Uh, happy to have you here today. Thank you. As a fellow lawyer, I practice law as well. I uh, do a lot of criminal defense work and, and done my fair share of civil civil work as well. Been in front of a jury, been in front of a judge a few times, but you've got me beat by several hundred, it sounds like. 
Um, could you could you just tell me just a little bit about what um, have you always have, have you always wanted to maybe be on the appellate bench? Kind of what what your ambitions there? Is this something just kind of you just kind of sure. worked your way into, or tell, tell me a little background there? Chairman Farmer, I thought I'd be a career prosecutor. I truly did. I enjoyed it so much, and I had a mentor who told me early on that he saw that in me. But through the course of my career, um, trying the more complex cases, I've been the white collar prosecutor since 2014, and that's led to trials that I never thought I'd be trying before, including a healthcare fraud case that started in one year and ended in February the other. So not only did I have to try that case, I had to go up to the Sixth Circuit, which is our federal uh, appellate bench, as I'm sure you know, and defend it. And suddenly my actions are in the record and had to read through that. And I'm proud to say through that trial and that process, a 19 count indictment with three defendants in a case that took months to try, no reversible error in any of the convictions, just a technical error on one sentencing matter. And I was proud of that. So I said, there's something to this appellate work and there's something in advocacy in appeals. And I saw that through and I really saw myself transitioning into loving the law, loving the law as it is written, as passed by you and applied in the courts, and then how it is, plays out in the appellate courts. So that's what led me to this role. With Mr. And I, and I think you're, uh, well, I know your appellate experience is going to bode you well on the bench, understanding the law here and that you're passionate about it. I uh, love reading and uh, understanding the law. That's important. And most importantly, understand the policy behind the law uh, will will help you as well. So I, I'm very confident that uh, you're going to be uh, uh, do very well at, uh, at once we're finished here today. So thank you. Thank you. Leader Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One question and then a comment. Uh, First and foremost, thank you for putting your name forward. I mean, I appreciate you and your wife. I mean, it's a team effort. Appreciate the governor um, putting you forward for potential confirmation. The question I have to you is this. When you're on the appellate bench and you are looking at some of the laws that we passed, and obviously you've seen the process and appreciate the kind words earlier that we go through. It's purposeful, the words we put on the page. And without getting any particular circumstance or dealing with any particular issue, if chosen to wear that robe and be on the Criminal Court of Appeals, will you interpret the language of the bills we pass as we pass them, not with anything extraneous, not with anything extra, but just look at the words on the page and first and foremost, uh, truly be a textualist and look at those words and interpret them as they are written? I am a textualist. I believe that that's the rule of law. That's the law that you pass through this process I've been watching and gonna happen here. That's the only thing I'd look to. I've never cited legislative history in a brief. And if chosen, I will never cite it in opinion. I truly believe in textualism and the power of the law. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great answer, and that's exactly what I was looking for. I mean, we do a lot of debates down here, but I've, I've always thought it's unusual when judges try to determine what the legislative intent is based on the debate, because sometimes the debate is just that. It's debate. It's back and forth. It's a critical part of the process, but the words on the page are what really matters. So thank you for putting your name forward. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I think he's an excellent candidate for this position, and I appreciate you and your wife going through this process. Um, it is an important process uh, for every judge to go through, and, and quite frankly, I think at every level it's the way it ought to happen. So thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Leader. General, um, along those same lines, uh, I, pr I appreciate your answer. We're, we're very, very uh, jealous here of the, the uh, legislative branch of government and, and believe in the separation of powers. And we'd just like to hear out of your own mouth that uh, you agree with that very same position. And we, we believe all three branches ought to hoe in their own garden. And uh, just want, want you to confirm that sentiment. I couldn't agree more. Well, I can say it, but the people of the state of Tennessee have already said it. Article 2 of the Tennessee State Constitution requires that, and it is crystal clear. But I've always believed that a judge or judges should stay in their lane. The judicial branch operates and exists for a reason, and it is not to do the legislature's job or the governor's job. And I have utmost respect for all three branches of government. And I also respect the work the governor does. So that's my answer, sir.
Representative Towns. Thank you, sir. Thank you as well for offering yourself. Thank you. My question to you, that if you're a judge sitting on the bench, case comes to your level, and with your knowledge, your infinite knowledge and experience, you see that the person that actually is before you, that legal counsel has not been properly represented, maybe misdirected in the wrong direction. What do you do as a judge over that case? Well, Representative Towns, I will be at the appellate level, so the record is already set. Okay. It's what, whatever is in the record. However, if that issue does exist, there's a procedure for that, ineffective assistance of counsel, that provides criminal defendants an additional avenue after the conclusion of their criminal case. And I know the courts are aware of that. I'm aware of that now in my current situation where I'm, I'm a prosecutor. And I have seen that, where that issue is litigated. I'm very familiar with that. So it's not up to the court to advocate for that, but the court can look to the record and find any issues such as that. And if something like that was there, uh, it would be legally dealt with. Yes, sir. So how does that person, the actually uh, defendant or how we term it, get the proper fair redress? Well, as I stated, there is a collateral proceeding that takes place after their, their appeals are exhausted in the criminal case. And it would start again at the trial court le level. And in that process, the trial court, uh, normally the judge who actually heard the criminal case, who saw the trial in action, who saw the actions of the attorney in your situation, would be best uh, in the best place to address that because he or she saw it. And then I would review the record once the trial court had already made that determination. And if it's merited in, in your situation, the trial court has made that finding, I would review that decision too for any appellate uh, legal error on appeal. Right. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Yes, Chairman Doggett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I want to say I enjoyed our meeting earlier today and uh, getting to know you a little bit more and your passion for the state of Tennessee and upholding the laws of, of our great state. And so I, I think that you're going to do a, a fantastic job. And it's uh, always refreshing to see honorable people to be nominated uh, to fill these positions across our state, very vital roles uh, in the, uh, the area of, of justice. And so uh, congratulate you again and, uh, and thank you for your willingness to serve. And Mr. Chairman, when we go back into session, would you call on me, please? Any other questions from the committee? Representative Hardwick. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Um, and thank you for being here. Uh, just a couple of questions for you. Yes, sir. As far as, and you had this uh, with the leader, the legislative intent. Uh, would you repeat the answer you gave to him again? Well, determining the legis legislative intent, I believe, can be found from the words of the statute. So that is the text that is passed by the assembly and by you. I think there's other ways that, without looking to the legislative history, that a court can determine legislative intent. Would you like me to give an example? Yes, sir. OK. That is, we can look at past versions of the statute and how the statute was passed. We can look how the legislature classifies the different statutes. For example, uh, Title 39, Chapter 14 uh, versus Chapter 13. Burglary was actually moved from property crimes to a personal crime. I believe it was in July of last year. But basically, I believe that could signify that the legislature intended that the crime of burglary is a crime against a person. And I think it would be proper to look how the legislature classifies certain crimes. So that's that would be my approach. OK, and I can understand and appreciate uh, that approach. But we're far from perfect here. And quite often, uh, the cases uh, before you and other uh, judges and justices, 
involves disputes about, that's brought about rather, because the legislative intent and the interpretation of what we meant to, uh, to do uh, with the words on the paper, uh, sometimes, uh, I, I, and I don't understand why it would be of any harm to go back and see how the debate uh, went, uh, what was said by the sponsor, uh, how the uh, the committee uh, videos uh, uh, were, what happened in the uh, the committee uh, work. So I, I don't know if I agree with you on uh, just eliminating that as a tool, perhaps not the tool, but as a tool to interpret a statute. Uh, but you seem pretty firm in where you are, and this is certainly not an attempt to change you at this point in time. Um, so if you want to respond to that, fine. If not, I'll get to my second uh, question. I do appreciate question. your opinion. Mine, mine is pretty much as you stated and as I stated to Leader Lambert. Yes, sir. All right. Well, I plan to work on him, too. Okay. okay. <laughs> but and help me, if you would, uh, are you familiar with restorative justice? And if so, uh, your definition and whether or not you see it playing a role in the way you would uh, sit on the bench. Okay. Um, as I stated earlier to Representative Towns, I would be dealing with a record that's already set. So that would be likely a trial court's jo uh, job to actually look at whether this individual qualifies for any restorative justice. I, I believe I understand what you're referring to, that is a rehabilitation rehabilitative component in an individual sentencing versus another structure that may be passed or considered by this body. But in my circumstance, my opinion really would not matter because I would only be dealing with the cold record. And that is the record that the trial court, who's in the best position under our system, to look at that individual face to face, hear from his family or her family, hear from circumstances in his or her youth. See if there is a need for rehabilitation and do so in the framework of the statute that is passed by the legislature of the state of Tennessee. I would only be reviewing the record to see if there was any legal error in that process. And my opinion really wouldn't be relevant in that situation because I understand that the legislature has a hard job. You all have to balance certain things. I know that the man who appointed me to this position for your consideration has his views. And I appreciate all the work that goes into it. But that wouldn't be my job to insert my own opinion in that. And I really can't be more helpful to you in your answer. Would you care to speak to that aspect that involves uh, reconciliation? I'm not sure I understand the use of the term reconciliation. Could, could you it, give me? Yeah, reconciliation with the community and with the victim. Okay. Well, again. Still working through the concept of restorative justice. I understand. I understand. Again, that would be for you all to create any sort of legislation that provides that opportunity. And whatever is passed here and on the House floor, the full committee floor and signed by the gov governor, I will follow it, whatever is passed. But again, if such a law were passed, that would be a matter for the trial court to consider because they would actually see the victim, they would see the defendant, they would see the families of each and be in the best position. I would just be reading about that person and seeing what happened in the proceeding below. And I wouldn't be in the best position to make such a decision. And I don't foresee, even if such legislation were passed, that I would be really the qualified person to make that determination. So I hope I've attempted to answer your question. 
Well, I, I think you did. I disagree with uh, what your job would be in reviewing uh, the records, uh, but I understand what you said, and I, I appreciate your position. On the Arkansas work that you did, yes, and I, of course I'm, I admire the general counsel there from the governor's office, but I, I can't understand why it was necessary to cite that you were in a Republican office, and that just won't, it makes me want to ask, are you going to be able to make your decisions fairly uh, with no imbalance uh, if it should come down to uh, parties, Well, political parties? Representative Hardaway, uh, the other part of that is I came when I was in Arkansas, I was hired by a Republican, but Mr. Edward Stanton brought me to West Tennessee, and he is not a Republican appointee. And I served under him, and I served under General Donovan, and then I serve now under Kevin Ritz. And politics had nothing to do with my job, and I guarantee you I will be fair and impartial in, if selected and uh, confirmed for this position. Uh, I've, it's never been a problem in the past, and I would not think politically, because that's not the job for the court. The court is to be a fair and balanced judge, be impartial to all involved, and respect the law. And that's what I can assure you I will do. All right, and uh, of course, Ed Stanton and uh, General Donovan, I still call him General Donovan. Uh, I'm familiar with both of them very well, and uh, I I, I, I think if uh, they chose you, then uh, and I can certainly appreciate their judgment. Um, but it was just odd to me uh, that it would be cited that you worked for a Republican office in Arkansas, but there was no designation that you worked for uh, or what kind of office you worked for in Tennessee, and I don't want you to answer that and get yourself in any trouble. So no, I understand. I think I, I think it was referring to the process by which the Uni United States Attorney is selected. It's a presidential appointment, and again, as in happening here today, the uh, Congress it confirms the presidential appointment, and perhaps the reference was to that. All right. Now, thank you uh, for offering yourself and. Essentially, uh, we know as public officials, uh, we offer our families and our lifestyles and our privacy uh, when we take these positions. So I admire what you uh, you decided to take on, and uh, thank your wife for letting you do it. Thank you. <laughs> I wear a lot. So thank you, sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Seeing no other questions. We're back in session. Uh, Chairman Doggett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I motion uh, recommendation for confirmation. Second. There's a motion and a second for confirmation for Assistant U.S. Attorney Matthew Milson, uh, Wilson. Uh, members, you heard the motion. It was properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, we're ready to vote. All those in favor of recommending the confirmation of Assistant U.S. Attorney Matthew Wilson for the Court of Criminal Appeals Western Section... Please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, no. no. The ayes have it. Congratulations, General, and thank you, Counselor, and you folks are dismissed. Thank, thank you. you. We're going to take things out of order um, on the calendar. We're going to item number 10 to start off with. There's a motion and a second. I've got to get the right house bill number. Oh, that's at the wrong one. Right here? No, right here. Okay, thank you. All right, we are taking up house bill number nine, and uh, Chairman Todd, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
House Bill 9 uh, has an amendment. Uh, it's an amendment uh, drafting code 3810 that needs to go on the bill to make the bill. There is a motion and a second. And just to confirm, we have the right amendment. We're talking about 3810. Is that what you have? Yes, sir. All right, I have a motion and a second to accept the amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment is on the bill. Please continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As amended, House Bill 9 clears up confusion in the law and clarifies that adult-oriented performances may only be held in age-restricted venues and may never be held on publicly owned property. Under current law, businesses that predominantly provide adult-oriented entertainment must be licensed and age-restricted to prevent children from entrance. This bill simply clarifies that if this type of adult-oriented entertainment occurs in locations that are not required to be regulated under the current adult entertainment law, because that the adult entertainment is not its predominant business, like a restaurant, for example, then that business must ensure that the performance is age restricted. The bill only applies to performances that are considered to be, quote, harmful to minors under the state's obscenity laws that have been in place for a long time, and which, most, uh, which are those performances that are overtly sexual in nature and that appeal to a prurient interest. This is a well understood term in Tennessee obscenity case law surrounding what it means to appeal to a prurient interest. This is common sense. It's a child safety bill, and I would appreciate the committee's support. In the amendment that you have before you, the, the few changes that were made, some really uh, clarification uh, items. The first, uh, there was an omission of the word topless, or the words topless dancers that was uh, traditionally in code. And so we got that corrected. And then um, in section 1B, uh, the first part of that sentence has been altered to add some clarification, and it says a performance of actual or simulated speci specified sexual activities, including removal of articles of clothing or appearing unclothed. That has been added to that. And then the other item is in section 2C1, we changed the word where it is an offense for a person to engage, it is now to perform. So it's much more clear, and we don't capture anything that we don't intend to there. So with that, I'll be glad to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Chairman. We've got some folks to testify both for and against this bill. And so I'm going to ask first, uh, we have down Dayron Johnson, Lynn Purvis, and Abby Rubenfield. If you will come forward, please, and make sure your microphone is on, and then state your name for the record. And then following that testimony, we will have... Chris Barrett, Landon Starbuck, and Adam Dooley. And you each have three minutes. And at the end of both of these, both opposing and, and four, then we'll open up the, the floor to the committee to, to see if there are any questions for any of you six folks. Okay, first is Daron Johnson, Lynn Purvis, and Abby Rubenfield. That's who I have. I'm sorry, we do have to go out of session. Thank you. Okay, please state your name for the record. Are we on? Okay. Hi, my name is Chaplain Darren Johnson. I am a 19-year resident of Nashville, Tennessee. Chairman Halsey, Vice Chair Gillespie, and members of the committee, thank you for allowing me time to offer perspective on HB 9. I have to admit, the first question I asked myself about testifying today was this. Why am I here? I mean, attending the hearings on this bill last week, it appeared that all those who described the overreach, the redundancy, and the outright harms of this bill did little to slow it from hurtling on to its next stop here. Even questions about the bill's vagueness went in the main unanswered. I realized the question then may be less why I'm here, and instead what I need to ask, what we still need to get answer on is this. What, specifically and concretely, am I 
doing here. For this is precisely what this bill calls in to question, what it authorizes others to police. Given the vagueness of who is included in male and female impersonators, a cast of persons made both more nebulous and broader by the phrases and similar, with or without consideration, following it, I wonder who might be deemed as just such an impersonator. Could it be me on one of the occasions I've read stories at my son's school? Or when I've offered the children's work in a church service where I was serving as minister? Now, in the history of this bill, there's a limiter in the word prurient on such what-ifs. However, given the ways so many others feel they can make my existence contestable, subject to redefinition by their standards, this bill leaves dangerously up for grabs who gets to make the I know it when I see it decision about what, about who qualifies. And not just in the courts, but in the moment, in the event, when someone sees me or someone else from my community and emboldened by legislation like this, decides there's something patently offensive about my presence. And while I understand the task here today is to consider this bill on its own particulars, it is irresponsible to gauge its impact in a vacuum. It follows years of this assembly passing measures that have restricted where and how I play sports or receive care from my doctor or even just to go to the bathroom. It seeks this term to ban care for my, our community's children and to demonize their parents. It seeks yet again to allow teachers to do anything but say their students' chosen names. And this assembly, in this term, seeks to strip my identity from the entire Tennessee Code and then, as here, to further call into question and police it. I say enough. HB 9 is an unnecessary, harmful bill on its own, and even worse when seen for what it is. Just one more grim discriminatory puzzle that some have been working on for years. I urge you to vote no on this bill. Thank you. All right. You're, you're going to have to save that to the end. All right? You can't, you can't do that. We, gotta, we have to maintain decor. All right? Next is uh, Lynn Purvis, please. Please state your name for the record in three minutes. My name is Lynn Purvis. I live in Phoenix County. Um, and I am a performer. I have done drag. I also work in the court system. And I see every day how important it is for laws to be spelled out. The code that you're changing is called adult-oriented adult establishments. And this is regulating business whose primary purpose is adult entertainment. This new vague term, adult cabaret entertainment, overreaches into entertainment that's happening outside of these establishments. We already have laws around lewdness and public indecency that protect children in these public places. And we all know what person, we all know what adult means, but the law that you're looking at thought it necessary to define it. But what's a male or female impersonator? That's not defined in your law. Does that include, as uh, the last speaker pointed out, all trans people in your eyes, or more importantly, in the eyes of anyone who crossed the state who chooses to enforce this law? If you are just talking about stated drag kings and queens, why are they in this list along with exotic dancers, strippers, and topless dancers? By definition, those people are performing adult-oriented content. But drag is not about exposing private body parts or performing sexual content by nature. And let me tell you, with the number of layers that most drag queens are wearing, trying to expose a private part is not even really feasible. <laughs> okay, most drag performances, they're not erotic or violent in nature. Drag is best known for humor and for glamour. So we're talking about people lip syncing, pop songs, and dancing around in elaborate costumes. Sure, there's some that are more adult oriented, just like in any genre. And as a performer myself, I always tailored the appropriateness of my performance to the level 
age level of, of the people in the audience, as any performer should have that right to do. Drag, as a genre, is not harmful to minors. Seeing a drag queen doesn't make a kid gay or trans, but it can help queer kids who are suffering see that there's hope of being able to one day freely express themselves. Google the phrase, drag saved my life, and you can read account after account of people who are alive today because they saw drag shows as a young person. Drag is a cultural expression full of political and artistic values for people of all ages. And we have the constitutional right to do that in public. This bill is giving the power to openly biased, anti-gay and anti-trans people to criminalize queer cultural expression. Please relent on this attack, legislative attack on the queer community. We are gonna continue to express ourselves in love and enjoy and love will prevail. Strike the terms male or female impersonator or vote down this bill entirely. Happy Valentine's Day. Please. All right, Abby Rubenfield, please state your name and you have three minutes, thank you. It's Abby Rubenfeld, no I. Um, you look just like your picture on Twitter. <laughs> um, uh, my name is Abby Rubenfeld. I've proudly been a Tennessee attorney for almost 44 years now. I'm honored to be speaking today on behalf of the amazing Tennessee Pride Chamber of Commerce, which this is a quote, advances common business interests, economic growth and equality in the workplace and society for its LBGTQ plus members, businesses and allies by providing educational networking and community building opportunities. One of our interests in opposing this bill is that legislation like this is bad for business. It makes our state look silly, backward, unwelcoming, and not a place to relocate a business. We do not need this. HB 009 seeks to amend an existing law that already regulates adult-oriented performances. There are already statewide mechanisms in place to regulate drag shows or any other shows that are improper or obscene. This proposal is simply unnecessary, unclear, and unconstitutional. And if passed, it will cost the state a lot of money after it's successfully challenged in court. I speak from experience. The state paid me and my legal team in the marriage challenge, Tanko v. Haslam, close to $2 million. And you will be paying that and more again if this law passes. Before saying more about why this bill is unnecessary, unclear, and unconstitutional, let me put it in context. There's no doubt that Tennessee needs to do a bunch to help children and families in our state. We have lots of problems crying out for relief, but this proposed law is a, quote, solution looking for a problem. Harm from drag shows is not an issue in this state. I'm not aware of a single report from anywhere in our great state where a child of any age was, quote, harmed by being taken to a drag show by their parents or simply walking by one and seeing one at a pride event. There are simply no reports of damaged children from these events. But we do have lots of problems that y'all could focus on and try to fix. Here are some examples. Tennessee has the highest rank in the country for foster care instability. We've had that since 2016. We rank 49 in premature births. We rank 42nd in infant mortality. We rank 38th in child poverty. We rank 36th for overall child rearing. We rank 33rd in the economic well-being of children. We rank 31st in pre-K to 12th grade education. I could go on, but you get the point. Drag shows are not the issue on which this legislature needs to focus or spend your limited resources if you wanna protect children in our community. But there are lots of issues on which you could focus and you could help children. So first, this law is completely unnecessary. We have a statute, as this, the prior speaker said, that pre regulates uh, adult businesses, adult entertainment. We also criminalize indecent exposure and public indecency, such that drag shows or any other performances that are obscene or cross a line into sexually inappropriate are gonna be stopped. And also, who does this cover? Does it cover what kind of entertainers? What are go-go dancers? I did a drag show for my 30th, excuse me, my 60th birthday to raise, <laughs> to raise money, I wish, um, actually for the marriage equality challenge. 
I wore a wig and a sexy dress and fishnet, fishnet stockings. Would I be arrested today if I did that under this law? What about performers at TPAC who do Shakespeare plays and that call for cross-dressing? Are they gonna be arrested? Did you say I'm done? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I just want, well then I just wanna say it's unconstitutional. This law is clearly vague. Who knows what, what's a go-go dancer? Is that the governor of Texas when he wore those white fancy boots? Who does it cover? This statute is simply wrong and unnecessary. Y'all have better things to do with our money here in Tennessee. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I Next have written test. May I submit? Chris Barrett. May I submit written testimony to my comments in writing? For the you, record? you certainly can. And Thank for you. those of you who requested, I sent uh, your comments that you had sent me to the members of the committee. So they they've got those. So what, if I want to file it, how do I do that? You, you just just email it to me. Okay, thank you so much, okay. sir. <coughs> All right, um, Chris Barrett, please state your name and you and you you have three minutes. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Barrett, and I am with Gays Against Groomers. We are a nonpartisan coalition of gay men and women who stand against the sexualization, indoctrination, and medicalization of children. We are also against <clears throat> drag shows or pride events that involve children, and that's what I'm here to talk to you about today, specifically exposing children to drag shows. As you may know, it's become fashionable for various groups to sponsor so-called family-friendly drag shows. Yet, as you can see from all over social media, these events are quite often not family-friendly at all, with performers making lewd comments, having small children stuffing dollar bills into performers' clothes, and sexually suggestive dancing. As a gay man, I have attended many drag shows, and they can be very entertaining. I love them, but they should be for adults only. Proponents of this sort of thing will suggest that exposing children to drag will help normalize and destigmatize gay people. I would argue that the opposite is happening. This is making gay people look bad. This is hurting our reputation, and we know going, uh, and we're now being called groomers, a hurtful trope that once largely went away and I never heard, but has now made its way back again. Many think that things have gone too far, and many gay people would agree with them. So while my main goal here today is to keep kids safe, I'm also trying to revert the damage that has been done to the gay community. I want to help it make it clear that I'm not suggesting that it's bad for kids to be around gay people. I'm not ex suggesting that at all. There are gay men and women who are doctors, nurses, firefighters, and police officers. Introduce our, introduce our youth to good role models like that. Do not let them attend drag shows. If we don't get this problem solved, if we don't get this problem solved, children will continue to be exposed to overtly sexual performances. We wouldn't allow children into a strip club and this is no different. And the damage to the public reputation of the gay community will continue, not to mention the damage done to impressionable young minds. I'm the uncle of several nieces and nephews. I want them to be protected. I want them to grow up and have a normal childhood. Let's do the right thing for our kids and ban children from attending these kinds of shows. Thank you so much. Thank you to the committee. I'm Landon Starbuck. I'm here today as an advocate for children harmed by child sexualization and exploitation. I'm a mother of three and the founder of Freedom Forever, which combats all forms of child exploitation. There's pandemic of a child sexual abuse in America where the demand to sexually abuse and exploit children has never been greater. One, I'm here today to educate moment, on- Excuse me, one, one moment, please. Leader Lambert. Mr. Chairman, point of order, and, and this is for everybody. Mr. Chairman, the Sergeant Arms and the troopers have the authority to be able to remove anybody from this committee that is not able to act like an adult and give respect to every speaker that is here. This young lady is in the middle of speaking. She didn't speak, she didn't speak when anybody else spoke. And Mr. Chairman, in a few moments, if folks continue down the road that they're headed by interrupting this young lady, I am going to ask that you clear the room. 
not just those that are acting out, and we have every authority to do so. We want to hear from everybody here. We want to hear from every single speaker. But, Mr. Chairman, it is important in any debate down here that we give folks the respect that they reserve. I am merely asking that everybody do that in this room. Everybody surely can do that. That's all I'm asking. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Leader. Let's continue. Tolerant people don't tolerate religious big bigotry. There's a pandemic of child sexual abuse in America where the demand to sexually abuse and exploit children has never been greater. I'm here today to educate on how early sexualization and exposure to explicit adult content via adult entertainment harms children. It grooms them into accepting adult behavior as normal, healthy, and even celebrated while it encourages them to simulate and participate in high-risk sexual behaviors. When a child is sexualized, they don't just lose their innocence in childhood, but the sexual desensitization they experience renders them more vulnerable to sexual predation as they're groomed into accepting being sexualized. Allowing and normalizing the sexualization of children empowers child predators and increases the demand to exploit and sexually abuse children. Child sex trafficking survivor leader, Dr. Jenny Sue Jessen shared the following statement. I learned from the ages of four to 17 that those who expose children to sexually explicit materials do so with a very clear purpose in mind. Through sexually explicit images and behavior, I was forced to see or watch sexual contact was normalized. The sexual acts expected of me were taught and shame-based secrets were created that distanced me from those who might have protected me. The graphic images seared into my brain then became my reality when the perpetrators acted on what they had just shown me. My story is not unique. Dr. Jessen lifelong experience and expertise on preventing sexual abuse is counsel we should heed. This past year, I've been exposing this new toxic trend of exposing children to adult sexually charged entertainment. Many child protection advocates have discovered a pattern with these events popping up all over the state and the country. The pervasive themes we've documented included subjecting children to grown adults, stripping clothing, rubbing their genitalia, simulating sex positions, spreading their legs in front of children, making sexually charged comments about their genitalia, grinding, gyrating, spanking, and exposing their undergarments, knowing children are present. These things have occurred while being called family friendly. I don't need a PhD to tell us that children mimic the behaviors that they're exposed to. Any parent can testify to that. So when children are legally permitted to sit and watch an adult strip off pieces of clothing and simulate sexual behaviors as an audience thunderously claps and rewards the performer with a monetary gift of dollar bills, what does that child learn? They learn that sexuality is a vehicle for attention, affirmation, and money. You can get paid for taking off your clothes and sexualizing yourself. People will love you for sexualizing yourself to please them. It's no wonder we have skyrocketing mental health crisis amongst our confused and vulnerable youth with more sexual exploitation crimes reported than ever before. The harm on children is calculable, not subjective. It's either right or wrong morally, and it's either tolerated or not tolerated by the law. It doesn't matter who the adult is, what group they belong to, what they identify as, what their intentions are, or what's in between their legs. It matters that they're adults subjecting children to adult sexual behaviors and content. The most dangerous thing we could do is remove the boundaries that are necessary to protect children. Children deserve childhoods free from sexualization and exploitation by adults. In clo closing, I want to thank Senator Jack Johnson, Representative Chris Todd, for doing your duty by introducing this critical legislation to protect the children of Tennessee. That was right on time. All right. Adam Dooley. <laughs> Mr. Dooley, state your name, please. You have three minutes. My name is Adam Dooley, and I pastor in West Tennessee, and I want to, first of all, thank you for uh, hearing my perspective today. Uh, I am here to speak in favor of this bill, and I do so because, uh, from my perspective, it clearly does not ask for anything that is unreasonable. I know that uh, many have made this bill uh, about putting a target on the LGBTQ community. Uh, I want to state that uh, that's not why I'm here today, and that is not why this bill is important. It's ironic to me that the bill singles out a number of various kinds of performance, none of which are represented here today, uh, outside of the LGBTQ community. Uh, this is a bill that is about common sense. What we are saying is that children should not be sexually exploited. And the debate comes down to one central issue. Is drag performance inherently sexual? And frankly, those who maintain that it is not are intellectually dishonest. This is a, this is a common sense bill. 
And all you have to do to recognize that is just change the characters that we're talking about. If we were here today talking about women who were half-dressed, uh, wearing lingerie, performing uh, in public by dancing provocatively, telling hypersexualized jokes and singing hypersexualized lyrics while taking tips from children, all of us would be outraged by that, and rightfully so. This is simply no different. Children should not be used as sexual pawns regardless of what your personal agenda might be. No one is saying that grown adults do not have a right to dress how they want to dress or present themselves how they want to present themselves. No one is saying that adults cannot attend entertainment that they choose for themselves. We are simply saying that this type of entertainment is no place for children to be present. It is simply common sense. And I have been frequently asked and grown weary with the question, well, if you don't like it, then you don't have to go. And that's like saying to a person, if you don't like pollution, then you don't have to breathe the air. If you don't like crime in the streets, then you should just stay inside. I am a taxpayer in Tennessee, along with many others who share my point of view. And we have just as much right to speak into what happens on our streets and in public spaces as anyone else does. And so you might say, well, what does that do to the rights of our LGBTQ friends? What about their right to perform drag? What about their rights to see drag shows? They have every right to do that but they do not have a right to insist that children be present. And frankly, I question whether there's some sinister motive that would drive the demand for children to be present. Thank you for listening. All right, thank you. Now, committee, uh, we will, uh, I don't know if it'd be better to get all six of you that testified up here or somewhere where, where the committee can ask you questions, but um, we'll do this all at one time or one at a time if you, if you remember the names. So are there questions from committee members? Yes, Representative Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I had a question for uh, Ms. Rubenfeld. So my understanding is that this is already illegal. So it doesn't matter what you are wearing. If um, you are doing something that is obscene, it is illegal. That is correct. There is no need for this law. This law is simply to target the gay community, to target drag, and to send a message to silence people. There's no reason for it. If somebody's engaging in inappropriate behavior on a stage, whether it's at a park or at a business, it's illegal. It can be stopped already. And let me say that I thought that this legislature believed in parents' rights to take care of their kids. If I want to take my children to a drag show, that should be up to me, not to you all sitting here. Thank you. That, I, I wanted to be make sure that I was accurate because it is completely my understanding with all that I've talked to that this is already illegal and that adding female impersonators or male impersonators is not going to change anything. This cannot happen in these places already by the law that we have. And so I guess my concern is a, a lot of my colleagues and a lot of folks in this audience I don't know understand that you can be a female and dress or perform as a female. So you're not a female impersonator. So does that mean that you don't qualify in this law, that you're outside of it and you can do what you like? I mean, there are questions here that are all over the place that aren't answered, but, but what is very clear, we have a statute, we have a law that says, if you behave in this way, you will be arrested regardless of how you dress, and that should be enough. All right, any other questions from the committee? To any of the folks who, who are witness? Um, 
Hardaway. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, Representative Hardaway. Thank you, Chairman. And my question would be to Attorney Reuben Failed without the eye. Yes, sir. First, thank you for being here. Um, help me understand what the difference is with this bill as amended and current law. Um, well, current law already prohibits obscene or uh, obscene behavior or public obscenity. So if the behavior that y'all seem to be concerned about, if somebody in a drag show or any other kind of show um, shows body parts that are not supposed to be shown under the law or acts in an inappropriate sexual way, that's already illegal under Tennessee law and the person can be arrested. This, what this does or doesn't do, I mean, this tries to extend the law, tries to add people when they don't need that. I mean, why do we need to put in female or male impersonators? What's, what's the difference? As Representative Johnson said, bad behavior is already prohibited in this state. And do we really want to start saying, like, on public property that you can't have a pride event? What about people carrying AR-15s, protesting? Like, that's allowed on public property, but a drag show that's nonviolent, non-offensive, that can't be there? I mean, that's just... That just doesn't seem like what the state is supposed to be spending its time doing. We have ways to protect our children. We have ways to protect our populace. We already have laws. Y'all can move on to something more important. And one other question on prurient uh, interests. My definition is, I don't know it how to define it, but I know it when I see it. Is well, that? Yes, sir, I agree with that. And I ran out of time, the chairman told me that's why I wanted to turn on my testimony because I pointed that out also. Like, I don't know what that word means. I disagree that the law is clear about that. That mm -hmm. means that whoever is the decider, the judge, the arbiter of the situation gets to put their values on there, the what's purient. That, I mean, that's, that's, our Constitution allows people to be free from being uh, charged with criminal behavior when they don't know that what they did was going to be determined to be criminal. And when you use words like prurient that people, different people interpret different ways, people don't know what behavior they can engage in, um, what's allowed and what's not allowed and what they'll be arrested for. And it sets up people um, for uh, political um, attacks for people being arrested simply for political views or just into certain people and not others. And, and we don't want that. We want the law to be fair and equal to everyone. Um, and this law is not. It's, it's unnecessary and it's too vague to be understood, which makes it unconstitutional, which means the state will have to pay a lot of money to attorneys to defend it. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir. Thank you, Chairman. Leader Lambert. Name is Chairman. I'll, I'll try to be brief. You don't mind, please. I had a couple of questions. Me too? Yes, please. <laughs> so popular with this legislature. <laughs> That's great. Just one quick question. I mean, you said you're an attorney, correct? <laughs> yes, sir. Do you want to see my bar card? No, it's not necessary. I, but I, I found it interesting you said you don't know the definition of purient. So are you familiar with the Miller test? I'm sorry? Are you familiar? Are you familiar with the Miller test? No, I don't do that kind of criminal law. But if it's a test where a judge gets to interpret certain words, then it's ba it's not necessarily clear to people. Do you want to read the test? Well, I'm kind of curious why you're not familiar with the actual U.S. Supreme Court decision that deals with the three prong test of determining what is obscene. How about Roth v. United States? Familiar with that one? I didn't know that you wanted. Um a legal brief, I'd be happy to give you one about this statute, it, sir. It's some of the most basic legal principles on the planet when if dealing you do with that kind of interest. Law. I don't represent people charged with those things. Let me try this one. Where'd you go to law school? Um, I'm sorry? Where did you attend law school? I went to law school at Boston University. I graduated in 1979, perhaps before you were born. <laughs> I'm not real sure why a basic question on, on the type of thing when you're standing here is a, I'm assuming, what you're trying to portray yourself as as a legal expert, I'm trying to get into some relatively basic aspects of this, and you've chosen to be insulting. So at this juncture... I I'm, find you to be insulting to me. Okay. I, I wasn't trying to be. I was literally... You are. 
Okay, so that tells me everything about your testimony, and it will literally be discarded. Thank you. Um, I have everything I need to know about your testimony, too, sir. All right, I understand your position. We're back in session. Um, sponsor, if you'll come down. All right. A uh, five minute recess right here.
All right, you ready? All right, we're back in session. And uh, I'll tell you what I want. I want to go back out of session. I want legal to explain a, a couple of things about what this amendment actually does and what it does not do. It should clear up a great deal of confusion. So we'll we'll go out of session, and and legal would please uh, respond. Michelle Fogarty, Legal Services. The the bill as amended by Amendment Draft Code Number zero zero three eight one zero makes it an offense for a person to perform adult cabaret entertainment on public property, or in a location where the adult cabaret entertainment could be viewed by a person who is not an adult. Adult cabaret entertainment is defined as an adult-oriented performance that is one, harmful to minors, as that term is defined in 3917-901, and two, that features topless dancers, go-go dancers, exotic dancers, strippers, male or female impersonators, or similar entertainers, and three, includes a single performance or a multiple performance by an entertainer. Within that definition, there are two other relevant definitions. Harmful to minors is defined as means that the quality of any description or representation in whatever form of nudity, sexual excitement, sexual conduct, excess violence, or sadomasochistic abuse when the, when the matter or performance would be found by the average person applying contemporary community standards to appeal predominantly to the prurient, shameful, or morbid interest of minors, is patently offensive to prevailing standards in the adult community as a whole with respect to what is suitable to minors, and taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific values for minors. Additionally, the definition of an entertainer is contained within this amendment. An entertainer is defined as a person who provides entertainment within an adult-oriented establishment, regardless of whether a fee is charged or accepted for entertainment, and regardless of whether the entertainment is provided as an employee, an escort, or an independent contractor. Or an entertainer can, is a performance of actual or simulated specified sexual activities, including the removal of articles of clothing or appearing unclothed, regardless of whether a fee is charged or accepted for the performance, and regardless of whether the performance is provided as an employee or an independent contractor. And within that, the simulated specified sexual activities is currently defined in our code to mean activities, services, or performances that include the following sexual activities or the exhibition of the following anatomical areas. Human genitals in a state of sexual stimulation or arousal, acts of human masturbation, sexual intercourse, sodomy, cunnilingus, fellatio, or any excretory function or representation thereof, or fondling or erotic touching of human genitals, pubic region, buttocks, or female breast. So in order to be, to fall within the, pro, the offense of this bill, it would have to come within all of those definitions. Okay, thank you. Um, for those comments, we're, we're back in session. Um, um, Leader Howe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I call previous questions. Previous questions have been called um, with no opposition to that. Objection. We have objections. Uh, okay, we're going to vote on calling the previous question. All right. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. no. The ayes have it. We are going to vote on the bill. House Bill 0009. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. no. The ayes have it. This bill moves on to calendar and rules. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're back at the beginning of the calendar. which is House Bill 128 by Chairman Garrett. Chairman, you're recognized. 
Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'm so sad the group doesn't want to hear a bill from the Comptroller's <laughs> office, but hopefully this will be quick. Yeah, we now have a motion and a second, so we'll disregard all that you said prior to that <laughs> statement. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This bill uh, has been brought to me by the Comptroller's office to hopefully make government be a little bit better. For those, for those that are in government office, this bill extends the statute of limitations from two years to six years for any misappropriation of money or documents as an elected public official. With that, I ask for passage in your support. Otherwise, I'll stand ready for questions. Previous question been called with no objection. All those in favor of House Bill 128 say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it. Your bill moves on to calendar and rules, I Thank believe. you, Mr. Chairman and Committee. Is that correct? Where is my little sheet that tells me all that? All right. Uh, all right, next is House Bill 548 by Representative Harris. Oh, did I skip one? Yes. Oh, I apologize. My bad. Um, okay, Mr. Harris will wait in the wings while we hear from... Representative also on House Bill 008. Is there a motion and a second? Motion and a second. Please, sir, continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No previous questions. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Previous questions have been called. Are there any objection? Nope. There is objection. We're going to vote on a previous question. Uh, We've withdrawn. All right. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is the package of revisions to the rules of criminal procedure that's been approved by order of the Tennessee Supreme Court. Mr. Uh, uh, Chairman, I can also tell the, uh, the panel that Leader Lamberth and I have the pleasure of serving on the Supreme Court's Advisory Commission on the Rules of Practice and Procedure and we're actively involved in formulating this one rule to the change, uh, this one change to the rules of criminal procedure. It affects Rule 49B2 and simply provides that service can be made electronically on attorneys in a manner that aligns well with uh, Rule 5.02 of the Rules of Criminal Procedure, and we'd ask the, the, uh, the, the committee to pass it. Okay. Th thank you, Representative. And I made a mistake. I, I called it House Bill 008. It is not. It is a House resolution. Are there any questions for the sponsor of the bill? Representative Johnson. Not a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, but not a question, actually. Just thank you for explaining. Representative Towns. Oh, okay. Is there any other questions for the sponsor of the bill? Representative Hardway. That's, that's close, Mr. Chairman. Hardway is better than nothing at all, so <laughs> <laughs> you're getting there. Thank you for being here, sir. I was inclined to pick at you until I understood that you served on that committee work, you doing that committee work with uh, Lita Lambert. So you've been through enough abuse yeah. already. <laughs> okay. yeah. Thank you, Representative Hardaway. But I would like to understand, in, in electronic service, how do you guarantee that it's actually been received and read by the recipient? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Representative Hardaway, for the question. Uh, the, the manner in which you uh, ensure that it's been received is that in addition to actually emailing electronically a document that's being served in either a criminal or a civil case, the sender also has to send a fax a copy of the, of the filing to the recipient who is able, if it did not receive the electronic copy, to object to the fact that the fax was not received either. So there is a, if you might call it a belts and suspenders approach. First you have the email that's sent that in the subject line has to reflect the fact that it's a manner of service under Rule 49 of the Rules of Criminal Procedure. And in addition to that, there has to be a facsimile sent at the same time 
verifying that the electronic service has been made. If the recipient who receives the fax did not receive the electronic service, then he has the ability to object to that. Okay. Thank you. That was well stated in layman's terms. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. If there's no objection, we're ready to vote on H.R. 008. All those in favor, say aye. aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it. Your resolution moves on uh, to calendar and rules. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Next is House Bill 548 by Representative Harris. Yes, Representative Towns. Mr. Chairman, in order to try to facilitate the movement of this committee, I'm on the bill. It's, it's his bill, and I, I don't mind taking it if, if uh, we, we don't think it's going to be, you know, Kill if it's going to be killed. I'm going to let him have it killed. Okay, you know. Oh, we 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 won't kill it. Let's roll it. Okay. Well, it's a simple little bill, you know. Okay. Uh, Do I hear a motion to roll for two weeks? Oh no, not two. So moved. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, no. All right. House Bill 548 rolls for two weeks. Next is House Bill 413 by Leader Lambert. You're recognized. You have a motion in a second. Hey, Mr. Chairman, this just allows for probation officers. Uh, we currently allow for those with college degrees and that have military service to become probation officers. This allows for law enforcement officers as well. Okay. All right. That's an explanation of the bill. Any questions for the sponsor? Seeing none, we're ready to vote on <laughs> House Bill 413. All those in favor, please say aye. Uh, All opposed, no. The ayes have it. That bill moves on to calendar and rules. Same, Mr. Chairman. Next is House Bill 450, also by Leader Lander. You're, you're recognized. You have a motion and a second. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, came to our attention in early January, the uh, some issues had come up, and the TBI had interpreted their stat the statute to mean that a person cannot get a diversion certificate um, sent to them, even though they pay for it, they fill out the application for it and everything else. It can't go to the defendant or the defendant's counsel. It would have to go to the judge or the DA. That's caused a lot of just havoc amongst the system. If somebody goes online, they fill it out, and they pay the $100 for the certificate, they should get that certificate or their attorney. Um, so that's all this does. It just adds in um, that, you know, it's both the requesting judge, district attorney, general, defendant, or defendant's counsel. All right. You've heard the explanation. Any question for the sponsor? Seeing none, we're ready to vote on House Bill 450. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it. It passes on to calendar and rules. Next is House Bill 385, also by Leader Lambert. Is there a motion and a second? You have a motion and a second. Mr. Chairman, I believe in, in order to improve this bill that you, sir, had an amendment on it. I, I think it's a really good amendment. I like it a lot, but it's not, it's not mine. It isn't. Motion on the amendment. Second. I'm glad for that motion and that second for this amendment. This amendment just changes the wording from jailer to jail administrator. That's what it means. So uh, is there a motion? We had a motion and a second on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. The amendment is now on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and again, this came directly out of, as I said in sub, it came directly out of the hearings that you expertly led us through over the summer on sentence credits. And it uh, came to all of our attention that in pretrial jail credits, it was automatic that if someone has served, say, a year pretrial, they would get their good time of behavior credits, and whether they actually behaved or been good or not. And so unless the sheriff sent something out saying they should not get it. Um, so what this bill does is it just says the sheriff has to send something to TDOC indicating that that individual deserves those credits. If they do, they get the credits. If they don't, they don't. So instead of making it automatic, it makes it a purposeful decision that both the sheriff, the defendant, counsel, whomever else wants to be involved can go through to ensure that folks that are actually deserve the good time credit are getting it. Thank you. We needed that bill a long time ago. I appreciate it very much. Any question for the sponsor? 
Question's been called on the bill. All those in favor of House Bill 412, I'm, that is the wrong number. 385, thank you. All those in favor of House Bill 385, say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it. It moves on to finance. Thank you. Mr. Massick, just a question of the staff for a moment. Yes, indeed. So is it, uh, Mr. Chairman, is it the, the policy then that if it is other fiscal impact, it has to go to finance? The answer is correct. All righty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, House Bill 412 is rolled for one week. Oh, two weeks? I'm sorry. It's rolled for two weeks. Number nine. Well, you do your work when you work with me, don't you? <laughs> sure do. We're now on item number eight on the calendar. It's House Bill 701 by Chairman Doggett. You have a motion and a second. Chairman Doggett is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what we're doing here expands the offense of solicitation of a minor to include statutory rape by an authority figure. It requires a person convicted of continuous sexual abuse of a child to be sentenced to community supervision for life in addition to any other punishment that they may have. Okay. You've heard the explanation of the bill. Are there any questions by the committee? Yes, Representative Hardaway. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, sponsor, for the bill. Would that supervision include any uh, mental health counseling? Or could it include uh, mental health counseling? Uh, that's something I, I cannot answer for you at this moment, but I can get that answer for you. All right. I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. With no other questions, we're ready to vote on the bill. House Bill 701. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it. Moves on to finance. We're now on item nine on the calendar. It's House, zero, it's House Bill 0705 uh, by Chairman Doggett. Chairman Doggett to recognize. Uh -oh. Second. I have a motion and a second. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this bill requires that a court ordering the expunction of a person's public records of a criminal offense to include the appropriate state control number in the copy of the expunction order it sends to the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. All right, are there any questions from the committee to the sponsor of the bill? Seeing none, we are ready. I'm sorry, Representative Towns, you recognize. I just didn't understand. You say the state, from their state, that information, da 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 da. Right? Yes, sir, go ahead. Yes, sir. When someone is, uh, when a charge is brought against someone, they have a state control number that is given to them. We're making sure that this, now that expunction order has that, that number will follow them uh, throughout the process. So that means if it comes from another state, not Tennessee only, just Tennessee. Just Tennessee. Got yes, sir. It. Got it. Thank you. All right. We are ready to vote on the final bill on this calendar. And by the way, you have done a fine job, committee, and I am I am extremely grateful for your patience. All right. <laughs> We're going to vote on House Bill 705. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it. The bill moves to calendar and rules. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? Yeah, we all motion. We are adjourned. <laughs>